What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Bush coming at you solo today to reevaluate the 2019, 2020, and 21 wide receiver classes. And what I'm going to be doing in this video, and shout out to uh, David Wasserman and Dan C. On the video that I put out about a week and a half ago called Wide Receivers to Target and Avoid, I talked about the 10 metrics commonly found among wide receivers with 15 plus PPR points per game in a season. And I use that information to evaluate the current rookie class that we have, the 2022 rookies, and see who might be a great pick based on that information, who might be a sleeper, who might be a bust, et cetera. And these two guys commented on that video and said, hey, can you look at previous draft classes based on this data and based on these metrics? Maybe we can look in the rearview mirror and realize that, hey, Jalen Rager looked like he was going to be a bust or Nikhil Harry looked like he was going to be a bust using this information. So that's what I aim to do in this video. So go back, make sure you guys go back and watch that other video because I talked about the thresholds more in depth than I'm going to be in this video. So to make sure that you're not confused, that video will be linked in the description down below. So if you want to watch that one first and then watch this one, uh, that would be highly recommended recommended but if you do enjoy this video at any point please hit the like button it really helps us out really helps us grow comment any of your thoughts down below again you guys can see i'm basically making a video based on uh these guys comments so if you have any video suggestion ideas anything that you want to see me do in the future by all means i'll probably make it if it's a good idea so leave anything in the comments down below and subscribe to the channel if you are new as well this data will also be posted to patreon if you want to check that out as well give yourself a more in-depth look the link is in the description tons more dynasty and rookie content on the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash fantasy stock exchange. But with that being said, let's hit the intro. Okay, so like I said, I'm just going to briefly go over the 10 metrics just in case anybody here didn't watch the first video, but I highly suggest you go back and watch it so that you're not confused. The metrics that we determined were prevalent among wide receiver one caliber seasons, and the way that I described that in the previous video was a season in which a wide receiver had 15 plus fantasy points per game in PPR leagues since 2015. So to qualify for this list, someone had to have 15 plus PPR points per game in a single season. And as you guys can see on the screen, these were the most prevalent metrics that I measured. The two graphics that you see on the screen are the 10 metrics that we looked at. And in terms of the percentage of wide receivers that cleared these thresholds, the left graphic is for all wide receivers who had at least one 15 plus PPR points per game season. And the right graphic is for only wide receivers who did it multiple times. So these were the true dynasty assets, the Devontae Adams, Tyree Kill types. And I wanted just to get an idea of both just to see if anything changed for the, the truly elite fantasy wide receivers. And again, in the first video, we deduced that the production metrics were the most predictive, such as yards per team pass attempts being above 2.25, best season target share above the 50th percentile or 22% and college dominator above the 50th percentile or 30%. So those were the most important metrics, as you guys can see on the screen. Size, speed, draft capital, all that stuff was next. Being faster than a 4.6, so not exactly being fast, but not being slow, was the most important of those metrics. Top three round draft capital, being drafted highly, obviously correlated to fantasy production, being heavier than 190 pounds, so you didn't want to be too small, and being taller than six feet, so you didn't want to be too short, also mattered quite a bit. And then finally, the common age metrics that everybody yells about on Twitter were actually the least predictive. So uh, metrics like breakout age above the 50th percentile or age 20.0 or younger wasn't actually that predictive, but it was still you know moderately predictive. Being an early declare, meaning that you declared for the draft as either a true junior or a redshirt sophomore, you didn't say for your you know redshirt junior, senior or redshirt senior season, and being younger than age 22.5 the day that you were drafted. So age related stuff wasn't quite as important. That's what we deduced from the first video. Now let's get into the 2019, 2020, and 21 draft classes. The reason I'm only doing these three draft classes is because I was not actually evaluating prospects in draft classes before it. So I don't really have a, you know, a take on whether or not I like that guy's film or whatever the case is. So, so if you want to check out how the 2022 class ended up stacking up, it's actually at the fir in the first video linked in the description at the end of that video. So if you want to just you know, learn about the current prospects, you can go check that out. But let's start with last year's draft class, the 2021 draft class. And obviously, being that this draft class is only one year old, it's a huge caveat by saying anybody's either a hit or a miss because we've only seen one season. The players could progress more. They could get better, all that kind of stuff. We were, for example, we were so-so on a guy like Debo Samuel, a guy like Hollywood Brown after their first two years of their career, but they obviously became studs for fantasy in year three. So just because I'm labeling somebody a hit now doesn't mean they can't become a miss later or a miss now can't become a hit later because it's only been one season with these guys. So I'm going to do my best with the information that we have at hand to label who's a hit and 
who's a miss, but uh, the highest scores from this class came from the usual suspects. Number one, highest score was Rashad Bateman. Number two was Jamar Chase. And number three was Elijah Moore. These guys were great prospects, both on film and on paper. But surprisingly, the number four prospect in this class with a score of 10 tied for the same score as Elijah Moore was actually 2-2 Atwell. And here's the thing with the scores in this video. Um, a lot of people commented on the previous video and they're like, oh, well, the, are these like your rankings? You, you know, maybe you're going to hit miss on some of these guys. This exercise is meant to be anecdotal. And what I mean by that is that we're going to use these thresholds as a piece of the puzzle, but you still need to watch the film and determine if a guy can play or not. It, this is not a definitive ranking saying, you know, because of these metrics, this is my model. This is how I'm going to rank these players. No, it was pretty, pretty clear to me why I wasn't in on Tutu Atwell. The guy was literally smaller than me. I'm five foot 10, 160 pounds, and I'd get my ass beat on an NFL field. So there was no shot that I was going to bet on a guy like Tutu Atwell, despite how good his production metrics were. And uh, there's a couple other standouts from this 2021 class that had pretty good scores. Deami Brown, Devontae Smith, and Terrace Marshall all had pretty good scores as well. Of course, it's still early on some of those guys in their careers, but it's looking like Devonte Smith was a hit and it's looking like Deami Brown and uh, Terrace Marshall were misses. And I was actually not very much of a fan of Terrace Marshall's film last year during the draft process, but I did get bamboozled by Deami Brown. So um, I was, I was about 50, 50 on those two potential busts. Rondell Moore. Again, I'm not going to call him a bust outright yet, but not an ideal start to his career, given that they traded for Hollywood Brown and, you know, Deandre Hopkins is still there. Didn't have the most productive rookie season, despite Deandre Hopkins getting injured. His bus signals were all over his profile. If he ends up becoming a bus, we should have seen it coming because he, yeah, he had the age adjusted production after a productive freshman season, but he was very undersized. Plus his film wasn't spectacular and he didn't have sustained production the entire uh, length of his career at Purdue. And no, those of you guys that followed the channel last year know that I was not in on Rondell Moore at all. I thought he was going to be the biggest bust of any wide receiver prospect in the class because I just didn't think that the profile was very good. Amon Ross St. Brown, who was obviously a big fantasy contributor down the stretch last year, did clear some of the important thresholds, target share, college dominator, weight. Uh, he just wasn't the athlete and didn't get the draft capital uh, of some of the other prospects in the draft, but the film was definitely solid. And I really did like Amon Ross St. Brown. And it's basically the same reason why I'm high on David Bell this year is because very similar profiles for both of those guys. I liked both of their films and they were both productive players and David Bell even more so, and actually a little bit bigger than a Monroe, just a little bit worse of an athlete. So the big time miss, as you guys could say it in this like model, if you want to call it that would have been Jalen Waddle, because you guys can see he has a score of minus 12. So obviously uh, the, this like metric based uh, analytics wouldn't have liked Jalen Waddle as a prospect and to a lesser degree, Kadarius Tony as well. But with Jalen Waddle, uh, part of the reason why I was in on Jalen Waddle, not quite as in as I probably should have been, but part of the reason I was in on Jalen Waddle is because his film was so good that it made sense to bet on him as an outlier. Plus you were able to explain certain holes in his profile, right? Because if you look at why he never had an elite target share, well, number one, he was sharing the field with Devonte Smith, Jerry Judy, and Henry Ruggs, the first two seasons of his college career. And then in his third season, when it was just Devonte Smith there, he had four healthy games that he played. And in those four healthy games, he did clear all the thresholds, 23.4% target share, 35% dominator, 2.82 yards per team pass attempt. So he was en route to a big junior season before he got injured uh, with the ankle injury. Again, the disclaimer is that the jury is still out on this class. We don't know who's going to be a hit, who's going to be a miss five years from now. But so far, this exercise proved to be relatively predictive of the 2021 class. So let's move on to the illustrious 2020 wide receiver class. And many people like Mel Kuyper and Daniel Jeremiah heralded this as the best wide receiver class they had ever seen. And some of those guys have been scouting since like the 80s and 90s. So um, I would say that this class definitely lived up to the billing uh, as in totality. Some of the players obviously missed, but a lot of big time hits from this class. So the 2020 wide receiver class, unfortunately, with the first guy that went off the board, there was no metric to tell me who was going to be likely to drunk drive. And honestly, if there was, I probably would have said it wasn't going to be Henry Ruggs because his, his best friend died at, uh, to a drunk driver. But so no one could have predicted that. No one could have predicted him going to prison. But for what it's worth, he was playing well before that happened. So, I mean, if that doesn't, it doesn't really count for anything, but. I mean, he may have uh, had a productive career had he not been a knucklehead. So let's go from the top. Uh, according to this, the guys that had the highest scores, the guys that had the highest projected wide receiver one ceilings in this class. Number one was CeeDee Lamb. Number two was Justin Jefferson. So pretty predictive there. Those are the two highest valued wide receivers in Dynasty right now from this class. Justin Jefferson, the consensus wide receiver two. CeeDee Lamb, consensus top five wide receiver, depending on who you ask. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that the next two highest scores were not necessarily the best guys, Jalen Rager and LaVisca Chenault. And also we had Brian Edwards and Gabriel Davis 
all with pretty high scores and they were uh, considered sleepers of this class. So about a 50, 50 hit rate on those two guys between Gabriel Davis and Brian Edwards, you probably got those guys in like the third, fourth round of your rookie draft. And um, Gabriel Davis, I would say has definitely been a hit uh, relative to where you actually drafted him because his value is pretty high right now, but Back to LaVisca Chenault and Jalen Rager. These guys were good prospects. And honestly, it's hard to say why they failed. Maybe it was above the shoulders. Maybe they, they don't work hard enough. I really don't know. I don't have a concrete answer for you because I did like both guys when they were coming out in 2020. I was a little lower on consensus than Jalen Rager, but I really loved uh, LaVisca Chenault. And I don't have really any real explanation with why they missed. But one of the things that this class was heralded for was the depth at the wide receiver position. Cause we have guys like T Higgins, Brandon, Ayuk, Michael Pittman, Jr. All these guys definitely proved that they were good prospects with solid scores here. Chase Claypool and uh, Darnell Mooney in this class also proved to be big time hits as probably guys that you got in the third round of your rookie draft for Claypool, the measurables plus the solid market share production that he had in his final season were definitely enough for us to have seen it coming and, and wanted to bet on him at the time. Now Claypool hasn't been a, you know, stud wide receiver one in the NFL but he has been, you know, a guy that returned on the investment that you put into him, which was probably a third round rookie pick in 2020 with Darnell Mooney. He was undersized with bad draft capital, but he did have very good production throughout the entirety of his college career, which we know has been the most sticky has been the most predictive. So I teased it on Twitter. And I said that when I was looking at these previous draft classes, there was a big, big time takeaway and a big, big time metric that I found that ended up being the most predictive of anything that I looked at. And I think the interesting thing to, to explain this metric is to look at a guy like Chase Claypool versus a guy like Denzel Mims. Now, Denzel Mims is a huge bust, right? He was obviously not a very good prospect looking back on it and, and is not a very good NFL player, but Chase Claypool hit despite having some question marks about their profile. Both guys were great athletes. They both tested very well. Claypool tested as like an elite athlete, but the difference in their collegiate careers was development. And what I mean by that is that Denzel Mims peaked as a sophomore, right? He stayed four years at Baylor, peaked as a sophomore, and didn't progress any further after that sophomore season production-wise, market share-wise, raw production, whatever you want to look at, and was a senior coming out versus Chase Claypool, who was also a senior coming out, didn't peak until his draft-eligible season, but at least before then, he showed consistent progression as a college player, got better every single season, finally had a blow-up season his senior year. So the biggest takeaway from this video, from this exercise that I looked at was player progression mattered a lot when it came to spotting bus. And you can point directly to guys not progressing as college players with guys like Jalen Rager, who peaked as a sophomore and had a down junior season. Same goes for LaVisca Chenault, peaked as a sophomore, down junior season, as well as Denzel Mims, like I said, who I would consider the three biggest busts from this class outside of Henry Ruggs, obviously, but that was for off the field reasons. So the 2021 class, also had guys that fit this description. Looking back at that class, we had Rondell Moore, who peaked as a freshman, didn't progress much as a player. Terrace Marshall had his best uh, statistical season as a junior, but the jump wasn't very big as far as his market share and stuff like that, especially when you consider Justin Jefferson was off to the NFL his junior year and Jamar Chase opted out. So typically we should have seen, if Marshall was a great prospect, we should have seen a blow up junior season. With none of those guys there, and yeah, Joe Burrow was gone too, but when you're the dude in that offense, you're a top 60 pick at wide receiver, you should have probably been a little bit more productive than you were. And some of the biggest hits from that 2021 class also followed that same trajectory of that progressive jump like I talked about with Claypool. Elijah Moore had a you know, solid freshman season. A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf go to the NFL. Elijah Moore blows up as a sophomore, blows up even more as a junior. Jalen Waddle, freshman and, and sophomore season, wasn't very productive. The four games that we saw of him as a junior blew up there. Same goes with Devontae Smith. Uh, freshman, sophomore, junior season, pretty productive. Senior season wins the Heisman. So I didn't intend for this to be the takeaway from this video, but it is something to be aware of and something I might dive into further. Guys that progress as their college career goes along. And, and for example, in this draft class, Jahan Dotson is the perfect example of that. And George Pickens is the perfect example of the opposite side of the spectrum who peaked as a freshman, didn't get very productive throughout the rest of his career. Same goes for Justin Ross. That's the big takeaway from this video for me. The progression in a college career is essential for a player to be productive at the next level. Not that we want players who to be unproductive for four seasons and then have a great fifth, you know, red shirt senior season. No, ideally we would want a prospect to follow the same trajectory. Elijah Moore followed where pretty solid freshman season. as far as production is concerned, have a great sophomore season, hit all those metrics that we want, breakout age, all that kind of stuff, and then blow up as a junior and come out as an early declare. That would be the ideal timeline for a prospect to both hit all the metrics that people are looking for on Twitter and also 
pro, uh, progress as, a, as their career went along. So that is definitely something that I'm going to be aware of more going forward into the future when evaluating future prospects. And I might go over this with the 2022 class again. But finally, let's get into the 2019 class. And the 2019 class was my first year watching players. I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I was just kind of watching them and seeing if they were good. But regardless, I did kind of evaluate these players. So Similar to Jalen Rager, we had a guy that was tough to poke holes in at the top of this class. Nikhil Harry had the highest score, which doesn't shock me one bit because his profile was very, very good. Uh, getting early targets, yards, catch rate, target share, all that kind of stuff was in favor of Nikhil Harry. But Nikhil Harry basically had the same exact season in back-to-back -back years as a sophomore and as a junior. So that failure to progress thing that I talked about with all these other guys showed up for Nikhil Harry as well, even though he had an ironclad production profile uh, based on every metric that you could look at, Nikhil Harry was a great prospect, but the fact that he didn't progress much from his sophomore to his junior season is really the only thing that you can point to for why he potentially failed. And that could show maybe to his maturity, to his ability to work hard. We really don't know, but I think that is a very important factor that we need to start taking into account with these prospects. Aside from Nikhil Harry standing at the top of the uh, class here was the Ole Miss wide receivers. AJ Brown and DK Metcalf had the next two highest scores from this class. And the difference between a guy like Nikhil Harry versus AJ Brown was that AJ Brown did show that pro uh, progression. And again, similar to what I said for Elijah Moore, you get a solid freshman season out of AJ Brown for a 19 year old. Then in uh, as a 20 year old, as a true sophomore had a great season, 21 year old junior blew the fuck up 27% target share. And that's exactly what you wanted to see out of a great prospect. And that shows their ability to work hard, get better at their craft, and also hit all those metrics that we want them to hit along the way. And then comparing the next two highest scores were uh, JJ Ortega Whiteside and Marquise Brown. And the difference between these two guys, again, was that progression factor. Marquise Brown as a sophomore had 1,095 yards, 19% target share. As a junior, he took a step up, 1,300 yards, 25% target share. He ended up becoming a hit. It took him a couple of years, but he ended up becoming a hit in the NFL. And then JJ Ortega Whiteside, obviously one of the biggest busts from this class, you can definitely see a little bit of progression with J.J. Ortega Whiteside throughout his college career, but the difference in terms of this progression versus Marquise Brown's project, uh, progression is that the target share didn't increase all that much, and his market share of receiving yards was actually lower as a senior than it was as a junior because as a junior, he had 781 yards, but his team only threw like 2,500 passing yards versus as a senior, it was like 3,700 yards to 1,059. So his receiving yard market share was actually lower as a true uh, senior than it was as a junior. And also he was like a four-year college player, which is a red flag in and of itself. So um, that's kind of what I'm looking at going forward is, is these progressing players as college players. We want to see these guys get better as their college career goes along. Ideally, they follow the Elijah Moore, AJ Brown trajectory with a solid freshman season, great sophomore year, phenomenal junior year. And then they come out as an early declare. That would be the ideal path for a lot of these guys. And uh, real quick on the rest of this class, Deontay Johnson, Terry McLaurin, these guys were really hard to spot. I, I honestly, like the only way you could have spotted these guys was by watching the film. I really love Terry McLaurin this year. I was probably one of the only guys that had Terry McLaurin as a top five wide receiver. And Terry McLaurin to me had just a great skill set. He, he was very you know, productive when he got the opportunity, but did not get a lot of opportunity at Ohio State because of guys like Paris Campbell, because it was a run heavy offense, all that kind of stuff included. And then Deontay Johnson, again, just another guy that progressed a lot as a player uh, from the start of his college career and into the NFL just became one of the best route runners in the league. Then there was a number of other misses in this class, Paris Campbell, Andy Isabella, guys like that. Honestly, couldn't tell you why they missed Andy Isabella, probably just a little too small guy that was productive at a small school as at a, as an undersized wide receiver, probably should have been a guy we were a little bit more wary of than we were. So um, that is basically the end of the video. Again, if you guys did enjoy this video, hit the like button, comment any of your thoughts down below, leave whatever recommendations for future ideas, feedback on this video, whatever I will respond and engage with you down in the comment section, subscribe to the channel. If you are new as well, almost at 11,000 subscribers, really appreciate the support from you guys. And if you guys enjoyed this video, want more access to dynasty and rookie content from us, patreon.com forward slash fantasy stock exchange is how you can get it link down below in the description. And also check out our sponsors, official sponsors, underdogfantasy.com using the promo code FSE at sign up and first deposit. You'll get a hundred percent on whatever you put in. And you'll also get our dynasty rankings manifesto totally for free. So that means our bucketed rankings, foundational players, you know, positional rankings, rookie rankings, all that stuff will be free to you by using our uh, promo code underdog fantasy, promo code FSE, like I said. So with that being said, peace out. I'll talk to you soon.